What if there were truths that, by their very nature, could not be demonstrated within the system they exist in? What if the human mind transcends any finite formal system of axioms and rules of inference? These are the questions that the incompleteness theorems proposed by mathematician Kurt Gödel ask us to consider. In the early 20th century, Gödel proposed his incompleteness theorems, which, in broad strokes posited that for any consistent formal system such as mathematics or logic, there will always be truths that cannot be proven within the system by its own axioms and rules of inference. By this logic, any consistent system will inevitably be incomplete, always leaving certain truths that require methods of proof that transcend the system. Physicist Eric Haydn, referencing Alexander Englert's article, We'll Meet Again, sees the logical extension of Gödel's incompleteness theorems as describing an infinity of progressively higher realms of reality. Haydn notes that this concept aligns with the Judeo-Christian idea of an eternal God. And indeed Haydn's inference to an infinity of progressively higher realms of reality fits hand in glove with previous work done by Robert Marx and Winston Ewart. In his article A Monotheism Theorem, Godelian Consistency in the Hierarchy of Inference, Robert Marx, along with Winston Ewart, found that through application of Godelian reasoning, there can be at most, one being in the universe omniscient over all other beings. This supreme being must by necessity exist outside of time and space. The conclusion results simply from the requirement of a logical consistency of one being having the ability to answer questions about another. Moreover, from his incompleteness theorems, Gödel concluded that the human mind transcends any finite formal system of axioms and rules of inference. In supporting Gödel's conclusion it is important to point out that both mathematics and logic are, as Michael Egnor pointed out in his 2018 article, Naturalism and Self-Refutation, immaterial in their foundational essence, thus necessitating that the human mind must also be immaterial, in order for the human mind to be able to have some meaningful comprehension of those immaterial entities. As Egnor noted, Mathematics is entirely about concepts, which have no precise instantiation in nature. Furthermore, logic is neither material nor natural. Logic, after all, doesn't exist in the space-time continuum, and isn't described by physics. What is the location of modus ponens? How much does Gödel's incompleteness theorem weigh? What is the physics of non-contradiction? As well, Denise O'Leary in her article, Gödel's Defense of the Immortality of the Soul, summarizes Gödel's argument for the afterlife. If the world is rationally organized and has meaning, then it must be the case. For what sort of a meaning would it have to bring about a being, the human being, with such a wide field of possibilities for personal development and relationships to others, only then to let him achieve not even one one-thousandth of it? As Englert notes, Gödel thinks such waste is impossible since the world he insists gives us good reason to consider it to be shot through with order and meaning. Hence, a human being who can achieve only partial fulfillment in a lifetime must seek rational validation for this deficiency in a future world, one in which our potential manifests. Indeed, Gödel held that science itself proves that the universe is rationally organized and has meaning, thus proving the premise of his argument. Englert also summarizes Gödel's conclusions as consistent with the Apostle Paul's statement on the immortal nature of the human soul, where our lives and bodies in this lifetime are only seeds, awaiting their destruction, after which we will grow into our ultimate state of being. As Englert notes, for Gödel, St. Paul had apparently arrived at the correct conclusion, albeit by prophetic vision as opposed to rational argument, as Gödel had done. Besides Gödel's logical argument for the afterlife, it is also important to note that empirical science itself now also lends supports the reality of an afterlife. For instance, Breakthroughs in quantum biology reveal that quantum information is ubiquitous within biology. Moreover, this quantum information is non-local, which means it requires a cause beyond space and time to explain its existence, and this quantum information is also conserved, which means it cannot be created nor destroyed. So the inference to a immortal soul from quantum biology is fairly straightforward. As Stuart Hameroff puts it, the quantum information isn't destroyed, it can't be destroyed. It's possible that this quantum information can exist outside the body, perhaps indefinitely as a soul. Moreover, the higher four-dimensional space-time of special relativity reveals that light is timeless and eternal, which is to say that time, as we understand it, does not pass at the speed of light. 
And this eternal aspect of light is an aspect that finds surprising correspondence in near-death experience testimonies. As Mickey Robinson describes his near-death experience, in the spirit world, instantly, there was no sense of time. See, everything on earth is related to time. You got up this morning, you're going to go to bed tonight. Something is new, it will get old. Something is born, it's going to die. Everything on the physical plane is relative to time, but everything in the spiritual plane is relative to eternity. In conclusion, Godel's incompleteness theorems, his logical argument for the necessity of an afterlife, an afterlife where humans can reach their full potential, along with advancements in quantum biology, and the correspondence between special relativity and near-death experience testimonies, all point to the reality of life after death. In short, the afterlife is no longer just a religious belief, but is now shown to be a very real logical and scientific possibility. To state the obvious, the implications of these logical and scientific arguments are profound and are, since we must all face death, of utmost importance. As Jesus once asked his disciples along with a crowd of followers, For what shall it profit a man, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul?